टुडे वी हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट प्रीता सिंह ओके वुमेन ऑन्टरप्रिनोरशिप प्रीता सिंह देर आर अ लॉर्ड ऑफ थिंग्स दैट गो यू नो परफेक्टली इन सिंक विद ईच अदर सो लेट्स टॉक अबाउट हाउ एंड वॉट डज मैडम प्रीता सिंह थिंग्स अबाउट ऑल दीज टॉपिक्स पर्टेनिंग टू वुमेन एम्पावरमेंट एंड द रोल द वुमेन कैन प्ले इन गवर्नेंस especially corporate governance when it comes to uh, you know making the places safer and better for women ma'am please tell us something about yourself of course uh, we have gone through and and learnt of a lot of things about you from various sources but we would like to learn a few things from yourself from your own mouth and then i'll be you know yeah picking here and there and asking a lot of interesting questions ma'am please tell us about yourself thank you so much um Suresh, what I'd really like to start with is in the beginning. Um, I think for all of us, whether you're man or woman, uh, growing up, your birth and where you grew up has a very, very significant impact in how you live your life. And I think the same with me. I was born into a fairly large family of five siblings. and i am the fourth of uh, you know f- i mean a fourth daughter in a set of uh, five children and i have a younger brother and it's very interesting what happens to you when you grow up in such a scenario my father and mother were very clear that we must all be educated and stand on our feet whether you're female or male so that was the first big thing that my parents did not differentiate that you're a girl so you must you can't do this or you can do that what they did mention however was that maybe if you do a job that is more conducive to being a mother to being married will help in the long term and that was something which from childhood when i was a young person made no sense to me that why should i choose a career or do something because it will go well with settling down having a family etc i could never get my head around that the second thing i think very important that has shaped the way i have and many women that i know have lived their lives is what happened to them were they given equal opportunity were they given good education and work opportunity and thankfully uh, a i got a lot of opportunity and b i fought for the ones that i didn't get so i think there was a there was a there was a spirit of wanting to unshackle myself and try new things So even when I did fairly well academically but I did not choose the path that a lot of my friends did which is get into the civil services or become a teacher or become you know the, the in my generation those were the very respected professions and there's nothing wrong with them but clearly there was there was a restlessness in me there was a need to explore and I think that has what uh was kind of the underpinning of my entrepreneurial spirit so even when i did jobs a i chose a convention not, not a very conventional profession of advertising in uh, you know way back in the 80s when i started working there was no way that uh you know parents from middle class backgrounds that i came understood what is advertising um in your terms um, um i have this concept of the way you relish or you enjoy your job it would be completely different than i would be you yes. as a woman leader you know what does being a woman leader mean to you i think being a woman leader has taught me and, and firstly what does it mean to me it means that i am myself it allows me to be what i am i think the biggest joy of being a, a woman and being by the way i'm not very conscious that i'm a woman when i'm working uh, you know i'm very conscious of the fact that what is it that i want to get done what is it that i want to do and do i really enjoy that journey uh, that's very important uh, people have often accused me of being very very uh, you know difficult as a boss <laughs> uh, being un, uh, unrelenting and i am i am at times and i reflect on it at times and i try and course correct but i have also equally got uh, a lot of positive feedback for saying that hey you help me learn hey you help me grow i'm i'm ever grateful to those people and i wish i could be more patient and more gentle but i don't uh, not in this lifetime i don't think so so i'm sorry guys whoever i've hurt out there 
but on a more uh, you know um, i think it's there's no you don't set out I, i've never set out saying i'm a woman but i have hit when people say oh is this a boy yes advertising was a boys club mm. yes in spite of whatever everybody said yes there was not a glass ceiling there was a steel ceiling so it's 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 all nonsense to say that oh everything in advertising was perfect and you know it's the most liberal way no everywhere i have drank i have drunk the boys under the bar, table <laughs> i have done everything so i worked harder maybe subconsciously because i was a woman you know in those circumstances but it is a boys it was a boys club it was tough Uh, today there's me too and sexual harassment and this that i think we just handled it you know in in our in our due kind of course so we've been through all that but i was never conscious that i was a woman uh i was very conscious that i must have fun and i must get what i want done and i must get on to newer things um, um uh, why do you think that it is very important for women leaders to be there in the board room I think for two reasons one is that um you know the fact is that men and women are different I believe that mm-hmm. I celebrate that I mm-hmm. think it's lovely that women are wired differently men are wired differently having said that um the fact that our biologically environmentally you know and the way we are brought up they are different influences and the way we internalize them and work with them so we come when we are faced with a situation i think a woman um necessarily looks at certain situations in a slightly more nurturing expansive way is open to um i don't think women are that self conscious or scared of saying something which may have an emotional connotation i have no problem to say uh, you know and i find um with men often so they're different to, to put in a short uh, thing i think perspectives are different and women bring a much more inclusive nurturing aspect often that's one part the second thing is there are two points of view there's a male point of view and there's a female point of view you're bound to get a very different outcome so women must be on boards women must be you know where big decisions are taken i think is necessary hey, you know uh, uh, women leadership coming and uh, giving representation is fine but i don't hear uh, most of these movements talking about a very basic and specific thing which is aadha hamara why do we people talk about 33 presentation or you know 20% representation it has to be clear and very clearly split out 50 50 ye aadha hamara this concept nobody wants to talk about it why why the ladies are not talking about it uh, why is 30 30- i'll tell you why in this is my this is my view i may be wrong but i don't think i am it goes back to your personal life i think if a woman was brought up to feel that she was equal to a male child she can do everything and when she shares her life with the male it's an equal sharing aadha aadha that aadha aadha will carry forward everywhere in life you look at it everywhere whether it's internet you know inclusion whether it is even access to proper education sanitary uh, you know your anything in life why don't women get 50 50 bloody hell we are 50% of the population we are equally represented why don't we get 50% it's because i think it starts from a sense of self if you value yourself you will ask for it if you don't value yourself you're not going to ask for it and i you know i i for, i for example i'm not married i share my life with a partner and i'm very clear that i will not be invited i have been invited to uh, the president's estate to rashtrapati bhavan with my partner as miss preeta singh i refuse to go as mrs whatever i am not so i think it's time and it was when he was in a very sensitive government position and i said i won't go and his boss had soft to him said pita you will be invited by name i think women have to stand up for themselves and say that you know i am so and so and i have to be counted and i will be counted 
one very critical question that I have to ask. Uh, uh, I have seen or I have observed a lot of people in and around me. This is so common. A lot of women had to take uh, or or cut short their career because of a lot of uh, biological reasons. I would say that you know uh, the institution of marriage and the way you know having a child and a maternity thing happens. This is something that actually uh, takes off a chunk of a woman's life away. Uh, what is it that uh, you think that you know these people uh, or, or or kind of governments or kind of initiatives that corporate or the uh, government should bring in to bridge the gap and you know to help them continue working and not feel that they are at a disadvantage? Yeah. See, Suresh, across the world, but more in India, if you see the number of women, the percentage of women working per se is abysmally low. If you look at the number of women in corporate India, it is not uh, any better. And worse still, if you look at women in senior management, it's very, very um, average. And if you look at women in the boardroom, it is abysmally low. Now, the point is, how can this change? This can only change if three things happen. One, if women are brought up to believe that while they have they are biologically different, they will definitely need to have uh, you know bear their children, rear them, whatever. But that does not mean that they have to give up. I know girls who have had two children and they are still professional dancers, classical dancers. I know women who have had you know, one to three children and they are in corporate uh, high in high positions in corporations, etc. I know I know many women, but they are the minority. They are the exception. But thank God they're there. I know myself and many women who never married. We didn't marry. And my joke with myself is, hey, Preeta, maybe if you married, you wouldn't have done half the things. Probably not. Probably not. Why? Because there is a reality. If you if it's not marriage, it's more motherhood, it's more the responsibility of rearing a family. That is rightly, biologically, a larger part of a woman's physical time, emotional time, finances go into rearing that child or children. So in, during that, there are many policies, but I think they need to be better now. There's six months maternity leave, there's paternity leave, there is getting back to work after you know you've taken a sabbatical there are all sorts of things but the reality is at the pace at which um, you know technology is changing uh, ways of work etc it's very tough if a woman steps out so she definitely needs many more supportive uh, policies and and practices in the workplace i mean a simple thing why can't a child be brought to work crashes a lot of manufacturing has it but why can't today you walk into these fancy you know offices google etc beautiful offices you can live there and all but there's very little some not many have but i think there needs to be more understanding that a woman who's had a child needs to rear the child and the child is independent and I think the more that happens will help. But there's also, a, uh, it's a double-edged sword. If you do too much of it, what happens is that the woman also gets singled out. People start saying, oh, you know, because poor thing, she's got to do this. So it's both a practical reality where she needs support and an attitudinal you know, shift that has to happen. It'll happen with time. I think women are, see what's happening. Women are deferring childbearing to a later date. They're having children later. They're having fewer children, but they're having them. They're adopting children. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, same sex marriages. There are so many things happening where children are, you know, being. So I think it's sorting itself out. But yes, any amount of support not just uh, practically, but uh, emotionally, financially, has to be given. I know somebody once said, and I was in an HR, uh, you know, in a review meeting, oh, but she's been on maternity leave for six months. I said, excuse me, what does that mean? That for six months she didn't work? Of course she worked, she earned her leave, yeah. She's gone to have a baby, for God's sake. So I think you need to balance those out. But there's no, there's no simple answer. Uh you have worked in vast areas, advertisements, uh, uh, teamwork arts, there is Perceptive Math, there is Ogilvy and Mather. Uh, 
it, it is very visible in, in in the way your work profile has been also done what is it i mean how do you prepare yourself to keep trying and taking risks and moving on from one creating such amazing places and work cultures in ogilvy and mathur i think I- yeah i you know when i was at ogilvy uh, for 21 years i must have done about 11 different jobs <laughs> uh, even as jobs go and the reason for that is very simple uh, you know if there's something to be done i'm very goal oriented i get that done and then what i ask myself i cannot waste time if somebody says hey you know i have seen people that they're very happy uh, kind of you know cruising along I can't cruise. I have to if I've given a task or if I see myself set myself an objective, I've got to get it done and then move on to something new. I have to have new challenges, new ideas, new things to work with. That's the rest create restlessness within me. And that is what uh in all my kind of working career I, what I call is um is something that propelled me on. and therefore a lot of things that i did even for rugilvi was what they call new initiatives i set up new businesses i set up rugilvi live rugilvi healthcare i first brought in way back when the dot com boom happened i was in bangalore i didn't know what the internet was none of us really knew i barely knew what a mainframe was and we brought in people from rugilvi japan to do workshops with india to tell us and that's how my journey with the digital uh, space started in communication in media so it's it's always been i think a very restless and a very cu- curious mind to do new things and frankly we are so blessed in this world and in this country that you can do whatever you want people don't stop you in business if you want to try something new they'd be a fool to say don't do it as long as you can land on your feet and deliver results um um uh, your role has been key in the foundation of serendipity arts festival and yes growth of this jaipur literature festival is uh, a lot of credit comes to you india is soaked in art and culture but to popularize it in the form of such festivals would have been very very challenging how did this concept you know uh, came to you that you know this is something that can be taken to the people and people will relish it and uh, what are the struggles that you went to went through these see suresh both of them have been as i call them happy acts of accident so there is no great planning and there's no great you no know, god said thou shall do this no i sanjoy roy one day whom i've known over the years bumped into me and said hey i need help can you tell me can you come over let's have a chat so i went across and i and when he shared the jaipur literature festival and where it was when i looked at it closely and i said wow this is you can grow this it can be very profitable it can and forget just profitable it can really grow it is very small and when we sat down and looked at it and is is just all the work that i've done over the years it's nothing special if you know how to do business if you know how to handle the creative aspect of a business which i did for many many years of my life and it is it is fairly common sensical how to grow something in that area so i applied all my little my learning i learned a, a some amount from sanjoy william namita and the team and the rest as they say is history it's not impossible to grow it where serendipity is concerned sunil munjal wanted to create spaces for you know art spaces for young people in the country and when he spoke to me it was sounding very exciting and there i had to conceive i had to come up with an idea structure for this uh, idea was his but how do you create a framework that will make it work again what's the big deal sat down brainstorm thought about it and uh, yes then 18 months of slog to get it going it was very tough to find these locations in goa that i that we found again it's it's not one person there's a larger once you have that intent everything falls into place i'm a firm believer are uh, talking about your experiences in uh, you know working in serendipity and uh, um, uh, the word you that you used happy acts of accident beautiful uh, how did this listen communication thing happened i i was just going through your, uh, your yeah listen was again another thing you know i was in 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 america and sanjoy said hey there's somebody who wants to have a chat with you i said about what he wants help to raise money i said tell him not me 
you know i can't raise money you know kind of thing so anyway I had a long uh, had a drink with him with tony uh, hollingsworth who's amazing he's the guy who did all the tribute festivals uh, for L- nelson mandela's release then when the berlin wall came down to celebrate that and and he's done some very large he's used the power of art and music uh, to raise awareness uh, on different causes you know right from anti apartheid all the way so tony wanted to have this brilliant has this brilliant idea called the listen campaign is listening to children listening to a billion voices across the world both from you know the developed world and the not so developed world where there are now after covid there are 1.3 billion children who are severely impacted and has this amazing campaign called the listen campaign and when he shared that with me and i just said tony done you know i will help you i will come on board so i am their country uh, head for india india is one of the key countries and uh, it's again you know suresh it's very different um if you understand um all of us as human beings if we understand our role to help people who don't have a voice and all of us have that in us you know none of us is ex- all of us have it in us to raise uh, to do our bit to raise their voice and get it heard and that's exactly what i hope to do thanks to you know covid we've had to push it back twice two years it's got postponed but it will happen in 23 and i hope i can do my bit because it is about women's day what do you want to tell women uh, on this march 8th what is it that they should differently look at differently demand and differently be uh, you know in the sense of entitlement there are a few things i think they should be entitled to i think first and foremost my only you know my my key kind of prayer for all women is just feel proud and celebrate the fact that you're a wonderful person you know the fact that don't think that i'm a girl and my brother's the boy and my i can't do this no celebrate the fact that you're born as this beautiful able being the second thing is once you feel that way about yourself fly fly let nothing stop you all these you know shackles are imposed self imposed imposed by society don't let anything stop you we everybody is unstoppable and women when you know they've set their mind can do anything and last but the least is just have a blast yeah i mean why should we take this thing so seriously i hate it when people get into this thing of yes if there's brutality against women and somebody is you know Uh, being um, uh, persecuted or whatever then stand up for it but for god's sake most of us are blessed with so much opportunity don't become your own victim you know just fly <laughs>